Great. Thank you to the uh, Academy's organizers and the other members of the panel. I'm going to speak briefly about informed consent for passive data collection and um, some of the special dimensions that may arise here. And by passive data collection, I mean data collected um, from a source, which is remote to the, from the researcher, and that flows to the researcher continuously or at regular intervals. And uh, I'll focus on three dimensions of passive data collection. The first is that the participant doesn't, uh, isn't immediately aware that the data is being collected, right? which is different from an in-person study. The second is that um, the data may be collected through a third-party vendor or um, for non-research purposes which affects the regulations that apply. And the third is that in addition to the what is obviously study-related data, there may be a lot of other data that is variously called secondary, metadata, paradata. That can be data, for example, about when the data point was observed, on what type of device, with what device settings, maybe whether the internet was working at that time, right? Stuff that could be important, but doesn't, isn't directly related to the, to the study outcomes. Um, so the first of the, should I, I guess I'll use my slides since I have them. Is this the clicker? Mm -hmm. Which one do you press? Oh, the, the green button. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't have it. Good. All right. I don't have slides. Sorry. <laughs> so the first of those was, uh, was the fact that the participant is not directly aware of the data being collected. So um, the, the challenge there is that you're, you're collecting data from people, unlike in a traditional environment where they kind of know what you're doing, right? They, because you have to collect data from the participant in person, they have a general sense of what they're being asked to do and what it, what it may or may not be used for. There are some exceptions in, in existing protocols that conform a little bit more to what we see with passive data collection, like, for example, laboratory assays on a, on a biobank sample, where the participant may not know exactly what assays are being done to the sample, and there may be additional assays done to a biobank sample over time that the participant isn't directly aware of or that weren't described in great detail in the uh, informed consent. So it's a little bit similar to that. Um, I think that's the, the concerns that are obvious, and you know, the question is, with what level of detail do we have to inform people or should we be informing people about what data may or may not be collected during the course of a study? Or in this case of some of these, this passive data collection, it may be coming from things um, that are not even directly part of the study, right? Like Apple Health Kit, that they were, they're providing for non-research purposes, which is the second point, that a lot of the data um, that we may want to collect passively is coming from these third-party vendors. It may have originally been collected for non-research purposes. Um, and the framework for dealing with that kind of situation is primarily um, drawing from HIPAA, but also more recent regulations, de-identification um, and uh, sort of cleaning of the data to be acceptable for research purposes. Uh, that, is, that addresses the, the concern of privacy. But I think we've seen that per, the participants may have other concerns besides just privacy, right? Participants may be concerned about what all of the various things that you could be doing with their data are, or that other people who may not be directly related to the research, but may be related to the third party vendor, or may be related to the non-research purposes for which the data were collected, what are they doing with the data? And they want to have a more complete understanding of all the different uses to which the data are being put. And that's what's driving a lot of the privacy regulation that we see. Uh, so the, the question there is, can we come up with a way of, of allowing for mixed uses and sources of data that is trusted by the participants and usable for research? Uh, so that's the, the second point. The third point is about um, the, this additional data that's collected as part of passive data collection. So that can include a really wide variety of different things. It can include you know, a bunch of timestamps. It can include information, really detailed information about devices, what the, what the settings of the device were at the time the data were collected. It could potentially include geolocation, which is a whole other area, right? It can include um, information about the internet and 
um, you know, whether the internet was was active at the time, the data, the, you know, at what times was the internet active, that sort of thing. Um, and that obviously poses a big challenge in a lot of ways, right? It poses a challenge of the multiple different uses to which the data could be put. It also poses a really big challenge to, to de-identification for research purposes because that type of data, the, the vast quantity of it, is very hard to de-identify, whether it's from a passive sensor or um, from a medical record or from any other source. If you have a large quantity, quantity of data, it's hard to, to make it de-identified. And certainly, you know, coming from 23andMe, we face that problem with genetic data, where you have a vast quantity of data that is pretty much impossible to make de-identified. Um, so, the question with this large amount of data is, you know, what, how can we make this something, how can we determine the correct amount of data to collect and make it something that people trust is being used in the proper way? The solution that we have currently is data minimization. And data minimization in principle can work, and maybe it can work for a lot of, a lot of trials in particular, but data minimization also runs the risk of not including data that's critical. And a lot of this, what we got 23andMe are calling paradata, but you know, other people call it secondary data, metadata. It's important for data quality control. Um, and if, you know, if you're working with a, a data source that's very highly validated, you might not need to do a lot of quality control. But generally, some level of quality control is probably going to be required even in the middle of the study. That could be quality control around you know, whether, the per whether it's the correct person, right? Whether the person is uh, in, a in a place where they're likely to be attentive to the, to the activity that they're performing, that sort of quality control. And if we give up some of these types of paradata, we may be giving up some of the audit trail um, documentation capabilities that Leonard was talking about. We may also be giving up some of the capabilities of the study investigators to monitor safety, to monitor how well people are uh, adhering to the trial protocol, et cetera. And those decisions have to be made very carefully. The investigator role in whatever, whatever we're calling it, <laughs> whatever kind of trial we're calling it, the investigator role can in some ways be um, delegated to technology, right? So some of these monitoring activities, like monitoring whether uh, people are adherent, monitoring whether there may have been a, a, an adverse event, could come from this type of passive data. And in that case, we need to have all, we will probably need to have all of this additional information, like when did things happen? Where did they happen? Um, we need, we'll need to be able to reconstruct exactly what happened in the trial, and we won't be able to do that if the data aren't there. Many of those functions in a face-to-face -face trial are carried out by the investigators. They're there, they're observing what's happening with the patient. They can document when it happened, they can document how it happened, why it happened. But in a, in a virtual trial, whatever we want to call it, there isn't that, le that level of documentation is in the data itself. It's not, in, it's not coming from the, the trial, the investigators and their visceral interactions with the participant, right? So I'll um, sum up early and say that uh, for a traditional trial with a narrow focus, a, the, a trial that, that isn't a long range trial, passive data probably don't pose challenges that we haven't already encountered with other types of data, like I mentioned biobanking data. We can resolve a lot of the problems through de-identification, through data minimization, et cetera. However, if we want to benefit from the full promise of passive data collection, and that promise is going to come from um, greater breadth of participation, right? greater uh, reduced uh, attrition from the study, increased adherence to the study protocol, these are all the things that passive data collection is promising us, and maybe even in a much further distant future, studies that are embedded in a system of data collection that's just always happening, right? That people are collecting data on themselves passively for a variety of reasons, not for research purposes. They may be collecting data about themselves um, for personal reasons, and we want to 
insert or embed clinical trials into those types of data collection systems, if we want something like that to be possible, we will need to really rethink the, regu the, the policy around um, how we get consent for those types of data collection systems. One of the, the things that we'll have to think about is mixed use and mixed sources of data. It, are the data coming from research or non-research uh, sources? And today that's critical, but in the future it's going to be very hard to disentangle were the data collected for a research purpose or for a non-research purpose, right? Why, 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 was the, why did this happen in the first place? We may, not, we may not know, or there may be multiple reasons why people are doing things, and that's the idea, right? We're returning information to people about themselves that they are interested in. They may be interested in it for reasons that have nothing to do with your study. Um, so that's a problem. The other problem is um, around uh, information, right? How do we inform participants over time about what data we're collecting from them, what new data we may want to collect from them, and what, we've, what interesting things they may be able to see in the data. So getting the information back to participants about what, we're, what data we're collecting is, an, is the second important point that we need to think about. And the third important point is how do we get repeated continuous consent from participants for the data that we're collecting from them? How do we ensure that they know what, we're, what we want to do, but then also let them know that we want to continue to do this thing? You signed up to do this thing a year ago, and by the way, we're still doing it, right? We want to be able to remind them of that, get consent again. Um, and maybe get consent for new things or remind them of new things that we're doing. And currently, the structure of consent is that it happens at the beginning of the study. The study is very well defined, and then you don't really do it again. You don't go back and, and ask people, oh, you know, are you still okay with this? Or, you know, we're doing this new analysis. Is that okay with you that we're doing this new analysis? That's not the way things are currently set up. I don't know that there's a policy or regulatory barrier to that. There may be more operational or technical barriers that we can work to resolve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew.